How does a Scrum Master help instill the agile values and principles in a team? That's an interesting one. That's a huge question. Uh, I will try and do it justice. So first of all, we have to look at what those values are. I'm not going to list the principles off the top of my head. I read them. But the values, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Working software over comprehensive documentation. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation and responding to change over following a plan. The word over in all of this is incredibly important because actually we want both sides of the equation. It's just that experience says, and it still holds out today, the left hand side is invariably more indicative of success. That's what is the that's where the value lies. So we need individuals and interactions and processes and tools. We just prefer and we prioritise individuals and interactions, for example. So how do we help teams start living these? Well, if we look at that first value, individuals and interactions over processes and tools, ask yourself, you started this agile journey, how? Was it by getting everybody together and talking it through and what it meant and working out how to amplify the conversations that were already happening? creating the feedback loops that are absolutely vital to both agile and complex product development? Or did you go out and find a tool that professed to help you do agile? Did you install it in your servers, roll it out across the organization and say, do that thing? That tool has a process, follow it and adapt it as you learn or maybe and in particularly big organisations, don't adapt it because we like standardisation. As a Scrum Master, as an Agile coach, we want to be on the left. We want people to be having those conversations. Tools are not there to mandate. They're there to support. So if you find yourself in the latter scenario of being tool driven, what I would say is, OK, that's the constraint that that organisation has put on you. Number one, challenge the constraint. Can you change things? And if you can't, okay, such is life. Come back another day. But how do we then use that to create the conversations? Not control them, but create them. Okay, How do we get that feedback cycle working well? Really focus on the people. Do they have the environment and the culture that allows them to have open conversations? Or do they fall back on tools? Do they update a system and expect that system to prompt, maybe an email or whatever, a notification, um, to be a replacement for the conversation? You need to help them understand that that's not sufficient. Um, there's lots of great tools out there. And invariably, when I talk to people, it, they produce too many emails. You update a system and it fires out a load of emails and the devs see them coming and create a filter and they all disappear into a box that they never intend to read or they might scan through once in a while. It's not a communication tool. It's a tool of record. Okay. What instead you want to do is get talk first, write second into the team's mind. Okay. So have the chat and use the tool to record the conversation. Okay. This means that slowly over time, the team are going to realize that the value is in the conversation. There's importance in the tools and the processes. A good tool and a good process will support a great team, but it won't create one. So individuals and, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Working software or solutions or products, if you're not in the software world, don't worry will be as inclusive as we can. As long as you're solving complex problems, it's OK. But working stuff over comprehensive documentation. As a scrum master or a coach working with the teams and the organisations, what I would say here is, firstly, nobody wants the documentation. We need it to operate our products, to operate our companies effectively. That is good governance. Sufficient documentation is necessary. This is not saying no documentation. So you likely have to have that chat with your developers. As a former software developer, I completely understand the desire to write no documentation. It's just a pain. It's not fun. 
but it is necessary. So we need to make sure, often through something like the definition of done, that we have an understanding of what we need to do, what is sufficient, and everything that goes beyond that, all that increasing levels of bureaucracy, particularly as organisations grow over time, more and more layers appear, and each one wants something different, you need to strip that away. What's the minimum that you need? And the way to do that is to challenge it, respectfully, but forcefully. Go to each person who is asking for their own report or whatever it is that they're asking for and ask them, what do they do with that? What is the benefit? What's the outcome they're looking for from the documentation they receive? And their response may be valid, in which case, great, it goes into the necessary pile and we have to do that. It may not be valid. It may just be that they're in a position of authority where they can ask for things in the way that they want and they're used to that and they don't understand the implications on the team in producing that. So you need to work with them and help navigate what is an acceptable answer. You're not going to win every battle, not on day one and probably not on day 100. But over time, slowly chip away at that comprehensive documentation and reduce it down to a few smaller and smaller pile of things until you end up with what is sufficient to operate your product and your business. Because throughout all of this, you're going to be building a great product. And I can almost guarantee, unless you bought a book, you didn't buy the thing for the paperwork. Think about it, a computer game. You don't buy it for the manual. The manual is useful, trust me. I'm in my 40s. If I've got to play a computer game, I'm reading the manual because it don't make any sense anymore. Okay? You buy a fridge freezer, the manual is useful to make sure you get the settings right, but the fridge freezer is the thing you want. You bought a thing to make stuff colder. Right? The paperwork doesn't do that. It's the working product. Get people focused there and work out what sufficient is, and your team will start really doing a great job. Customer collaboration, over contract negotiation. Contracts are necessary in business. They're good business, but they do not predict success. Contracts are really there for when stuff goes wrong. So we want to avoid using them. We need them in place and they need to set the scene, but they are not actually gonna help you build a great product. What we need to do is work with that customer to understand their evolving needs over time. So. As a scrum master, you've likely got somebody called a product owner or something similar. That's great, they're a proxy for that customer. Maybe you're really fortunate and they are the true customer. Brilliant. Your role here is to make sure there's an ongoing conversation between that product owner and the developers who are building the product. Okay? It's not to sit in the way of it. It's not to have a member of the development team talking to that product owner. It's all of them having open, continuous conversations to really understand what the need is, what the problem is that they need to solve, and then they can have great conversations about how to solve it. Okay. If your product owner is that proxy, they're sat in and acting as the voice of the customer, then part of your role is going to be absolutely connecting them and making sure that as a team they really function very, very effectively, but also helping that product owner understand that they are a proxy, that they are acting as the voice of, they are not the customer. And where possible, connecting your developers with the real customers. Now that may be you, that may be your product owner who does that connection, but you're gonna be there just in the ear of your product owner, reminding them that they don't know everything. That actually it's better to talk to the real customer, somebody with the problem, than it is any intermediary, no matter how well qualified they are. Okay? Because every single person that enters that chain introduces an opportunity for miscommunication, misunderstanding, and potentially solving the wrong problem. If you've got that great relationship with your customer, it's fantastic. What my experience says is work on that customer relationship because stuff will go wrong, and when it does, the customer's on your side. They've been on this journey with you, they've understood what's happening, and they will give you the benefit of the doubt. They're not gonna go to that contract. 
they're not going to go and work out who's at fault. They're going to say, OK, you've tried your hardest. I can see it. It's just not possible. So how do we move forward? They will join in that conversation openly and willingly. And the lawyers don't get all of our money. And finally, the fourth value in the Agile Manifesto is responding to change over following a plan. In my classes, I run an exercise looking at all of these values, and this one is often the most balanced. Right? You see lots for responding to change and a reasonably similar amount for following a plan. But what's interesting is when you dive into that, it's not about following a plan. When you think of it, following a plan, regardless of what you learnt, is just daft. We don't want to do that. Now, having a plan and following a plan while it's valid is useful because it's a great way of aligning everybody. But what we really want to do is help the team understand that that plan is transient. It's only going to be right for a short period of time. And as soon as we recognize it's no longer correct, we need to change. We need to do something different based on what we've learned, which may involve updating the plan. In fact, if that plan is a useful tool, and it's easy to update, you can do that quite regularly. If it's difficult to update or locked away or somebody else has to do it, it's gonna fall by the wayside very quickly. What we're doing with our teams here is helping them understand that as we do, as we build things, as we create, as we research, as we learn, we're gonna uncover more information. We're gonna break assumptions. And in doing that, what we do know is that plan is going to become wrong and you have a choice at that point you can stick to your plan you can do what you say you would when you knew less or you can respond to that change you can do something different and ultimately deliver a better product the right product for that problem okay. some teams do stick to following a plan however they're few and far between in my experience some organizations stick to following a plan they're also few though not fewer, um, and they're not further between. Um, it does happen. Be wary of it. What you want to do is help your team understand that they're not wrong. They planned, they created a plan, and that was okay. That was based on their learning today. Tomorrow they may know something new, and the only sensible option really is to do something different. So, as a Scrum Master, as an Agile coach, we're looking to bring all four of these values alive within each team that we work with, with each organization that we work with. Okay, And it's very often that we need to focus on both sides of the equation. It's not only that left-hand side where we create value and how do we increase that and how do we create the connections necessary, but also we need to work on reducing the effort expended on the right-hand side to such a point that we're doing enough there but not so much that it's taking away from the left we want to do enough documentation to manage our product we want the right processes the right tools in place but not so that they smother teams we want contracts stuff goes wrong we're going to have to fall back on them at some point it's good business it's common sense that we have something to support us but not to the detriment of a great conversation with our customer and we like plans we like planning. The Agile world does a lot of planning. Okay. Plans are a great way of communicating what we intend to do, but don't stick to them at the detriment of learning things and building something that is better than what you thought was possible when you sat down. We learn more as we go along. It's going to continuously change and we need to get happy and comfortable with the idea that we're going to go off plan and likely very quickly. If you've got to this point in the video, I hope you've enjoyed it. If so, a like would be appreciated. If you want to hear more from me, more answers to questions that maybe you've got in the Agile world, please subscribe to the channel. And if you've got a question that you really want answered, drop it in the comments. I promise we'll get around to it. Thank you.